What does Sean Baker's new film about a down and out porn star have in common with an 80 year old European film movement? It turns out quite a lot. Red Rocket follows Mickey Saber, a down on his luck porn star forced to move back to the Texas Gulf refinery town he grew up in that has also seen better days. Nike, go f yourself. A charismatic people user, he relies on his boyish charm to get what he needs from his ex-wife and other locals in his desperate attempt to get back to LA and back into porn. Red Rocket, like his other films, is emblematic of Baker's filmmaking style capturing authentic, complex, and grounded slices of American life that are traditionally overlooked by Hollywood. But his films are also an echo of a cinematic movement that came out of Italy after World War II, Italian neorealism. Well, and definitely inspired by Italian neorealism. If you look at my earlier films, I'm really wearing that influence on my sleeve. Whereas Starlet and Tangerine started to allow me to explore a different approach to it, still grounding things in reality, still using real people, real locations, all that. But I'm hoping to be a, f a filmmaker who is just isn't repeating the past. It's been almost 80 years since directors like Roberto Rossellini and Vittoria Di Sia photographed their unrelentingly bleak portraits of daily life and the harsh economic realities of post-war Italy. But their filmmaking philosophies are still alive and well in Sean Baker, albeit evolved. So let's take a look at how Sean Baker has become the preeminent American neorealist. Before we get into Baker's work, we're going to take a quick detour to war-torn Rome to reacquaint ourselves with the finer points of Italian neorealism. In the early 1940s, after Italy rid itself of fascism and survived the full destructive brunt of the Allied war machine, filmmakers like Visconti, De Sia, and Rossellini started making films that sought to capture the realism of literature. <laughs> Vittorio De Sia's Bicycle Thieves is probably the most famous film of the movement. It follows Antonio, whose bike was stolen just as he got a new job hanging posters around town. Without his bike, Antonio could lose his new job, so he and his son roamed the streets of Rome looking for it. The film relies heavily on production tropes that have become synonymous with the movement, including on-location shooting, using untrained actors, and of course, producing these movies with minimal budgets. Over 80 years later, Sean Baker's films successfully embody the neorealist quest for realism since he utilizes similar tactics. And for Baker, it all starts with making the most out of the film's location. The shooting in the real locations, like, yeah, it's partly a neorealist thing. It's partly about keeping it authentic and keeping it grounded. But also, I can't afford a studio. So this is stuff that I have to accept and make the most of. Shooting in real locations is paramount to Baker's work, not only because he usually can't afford a studio, but also because real locations add a layer of authenticity that is difficult, if not impossible, to recreate on a soundstage. More than that, on-location shooting also adds an element of risk. Daddy, go home. Um, bye. Don't tell anyone. Grandma. Frequently, Baker doesn't have the resources to completely control his locations. While that could be difficult at times, he has learned to leverage it as a potential engine for unconstrained creativity. Can you please tell her I, I don't do drugs? No, nah, please nah, tell her. He don't do my drugs. Nah, That's right. just all these bitches. He my bitches. Scenes like these in Tangerine were being shot while Donut Time was still open. Baker couldn't afford to close Donut Time for production, but it was crucial that the film was shot in that particular donut shop. And sometimes what's there in the moment can be just so much more special and unexpected, something you could never write. So budgetary limitations have actually, you know, led to a lot of what I like most about my work. Yeah, you, you gotta go home. There's cars coming through here. We got guests. No harm, no foul. There's a joke in there somewhere. According to Baker, those cranes are an endangered species and should not have been approached. But Baker, always looking for serendipitous opportunity, noticed the cranes, pivoted the crew, and released Defoe, who was able to improv the line that beautifully summarized Bobby's attitude toward the children that was never part of the script. Red Rocket also provided Baker with some happy accidents. There's a shot involving a train that would only have been possible with a huge budget to buy a train or with Baker's unique brand of luck that could best be described as when preparedness needs opportunity. Sometimes it comes down to you not getting a second chance on things. We didn't have control over that train. I mean, it's not like we could back that train up three times and get the shot three times. No, it only came by once a day. 
but we found out at the last second we had 20 minutes to do it and simon was still driving you know he was coming from the hotel we were like you better get here now you know and then it all came together the train came in the shot was working and then the conductor blew the horn at literally the perfect frame i couldn't ask for a better placement of that horn that he hit. He did it right over the part he was supposed to do it in the script. It was one of those serendipity, happy accident moments that felt like a gift from the film god. That train shot is a classic tale of happenstance that comes with being in the right place at the right time. And Baker spent a lot of time trying to find the right place to shoot Red Rocket. Life sweet, Sophie. Life is sweet. On his quest for a refinery town, he started in Corpus Christi and drove up the coast. Baker and his cinematographer Drew Daniels knew they wanted a visual style similar to the Sugarland Express, so they went looking for a refinery town that would provide them with the browns and warm hues captured in the 1974 Prison Escape classic. They eventually landed on Texas City, which not only has a rich history that intrigued Baker, but as luck would have it, it also had a donut shop right on the edge of a refinery. The Red Rocket script was written for a food truck in mind, but Baker couldn't help but fall in love with the meta connection to donut time in Tangerine. While Texas City proved to be an excellent location for Baker to find his Sugarland Express look, it also provided him with a trove of unanticipated talent. And when you're in that place, it's like, how can you not like take advantage of like people who are actually working there? You know, you know this world better than I do. Do you want to play a version of yourself? You know, there's lots of that. And then there's collaboration that leads to like just a, a greater, you know, just 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 us uh, finding stuff in your work you never would have found without it. Baker found multiple actors for roles in Texas City. Characters like Lonnie and June were played by locals he discovered in Texas City. Brittany, who plays June, was a refinery worker walking her dog when she was approached by Baker. And Ethan was a movie buff working as a waiter in a restaurant when he was asked by Baker if he wanted to be in a movie. In Red Rocket, like his other films, he relied on actors like Brittany to bring both their authentic selves to the role and their first-hand experiences to ensure the film's depiction of Texas City was accurate. But then there's also the opportunity I get to collaborate with them in a, on a consultant level too. So if they're from a community or from a location that I'm not from, as a screenwriter, I'm not precious about anything that I've written about that world. They know it better than I do. So I'll say, hey, is this does this line work? Would somebody living in Texas City ever say this? And if not, what would they say? And I have a lot of these types of conversations and uh, and it often works out really well because I'm getting, we're bringing a lot of local color in and local details and slang that we don't define, we just put it out there. And you know, it's, it's really that sort of great collaboration that comes about with first timers as well. Baker leans on his actors for more than just local flavor. As a big believer in improv and constantly on the hunt for happy accidents, he also works closely with his actors to make them feel comfortable enough to encourage ad-libbing on set. I'm asking them to just spit out any Thing. And I, I always say, oh, but I'm also the editor. Don't worry, I'll make it work. I'm going to make you look great, but be fearless. And I've really surrounded myself. I've been so incredibly lucky because I found so many first timers who who are fearless and they, they, they might they throw out a line. We all know on set that line doesn't work. Doesn't matter. In the in the next take, they'll try it again and we'll get it. Baker cast Bria Venitia because of her Instagram. She wasn't a classically trained actor, but Baker worked with her on Haley's character and by the time they started shooting, she was ready and willing to improv. Moments like this scene by the pool utilize improv as well as these moments where Haley and Mooney are selling perfume. This will make you handsome. Come on. Actually, actually, sir, can you just give us a couple bucks just for me and my kid if you're not going to buy the perfume? They were shot candid camera style with the actresses actually trying to push their wares onto random strangers in hotel parking lots. As for Tangerine, Baker collaborated extensively with his leads in that film. He met Maya Taylor, who plays Alexander in an LGBT center a block away from where the movie was shot. That proved to be extremely beneficial since Maya also introduced him to Tangerine's other lead, Kiki, who plays Cindy. As a cis white man, Baker knew that he was unfamiliar with the community and worked extensively with Maya and Kiki to develop the story and the scriptment they ultimately used in the film. Cindy's plotline of a woman scorned, that was originally pitched by Kiki, and Baker worked closely with his cast to make sure both the story was accurate to the world they were trying to portray and that the film also maintained a sense of humor. This is what you paid for. Come on, you know you want it. Uh, 
You see right through me, don't oh, you? Yeah. And since they were only shooting with a partial script, a significant amount of that film turned out to be improvised. So did Mr. Falapo have a big What? Spit it out. I didn't. I swallowed it. I know. I, I set that one up, didn't I? One noticeable quality about Baker's films is how every one of his actors seem to really put themselves out there in regards to their performance, which is possible because Baker cultivates an ironclad sense of trust and experimentation on his sets. And since he edits most of his films, he knows exactly what he's looking for and encourages his actors to experiment knowing that bad takes will never see the light of day. Sean relies heavily on non-traditional actors because he's telling non-traditional stories about authentic people with common problems struggling to get by in America. Yeah, these stories of survival, especially in a country that touts itself as like this, you know, uh, capitalism is, is wonderful and will solve everything. Well, obviously it's not. There are those who are not let allowed into the mainstream economy, whether that's due to racism, sexism, perhaps even, you know, if you're an undocumented immigrant, if you're a felon, there's so many reasons why you might not be granted access. And what do you do? You turn to the underground economy to live. Baker's drive to tell stories about people on the fringes of society struggling to get by is exactly what the Italian neorealists were trying to do almost 80 years ago. And thanks to the flexibility and discipline needed to shoot on location with non-traditional actors, he's been able to create stories that evoke that same literary realism directors like DeSia were trying to capture all those years ago. Except now, he manages to capture that same visceral authenticity while also using in sync. But it's morphed a little bit. It's morphed into perhaps a, a semi more poppy realm. And that that the reason behind that is to, to reach a greater audience than also just to, to to mix it up a bit. You know, it's like I was very inspired by the Italian neorealists and but they already did it. You know, they did that. <laughs> um, I'm hoping to be a filmmaker who is just isn't repeating the past. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to check out our other videos on IGN Movies and TV. And as always, subscribe for more new videos.